Funk Zone. This time, we're at a top secret winery. Well, not really, but it's Area 5.1 with owner and winemaker, Martin Brown. Hi, good to be here. I'm so glad you could do this, bud. So tell me, what, tell me your concept here. Well, I, uh, since I arrived from that foreign country, Australia, as you know, illegal alien, no, not really. Um, I arrived here and uh, when I got my green card, they said I was a resident alien. So I thought that it would be really good to have a winery that was wine made by your friendly resident aliens. So that's how I came up with the concept. Uh, it kind of started before that because my brother and I have a winery up in the San Inez Valley called Calira Winery. And I wanted to do a little spin-off where I kind of specialized in doing some more imaginative kind of new world blends, a uh, little bit out of the, uh, away from the traditional notebook on, on blending, uh, simply because San Inez Valley and Santa Barbara County was the home to so many wines that had their origins in different parts of the old world. We have French, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, German, Austrian, Hungarian, Croatian, etc. All these grapes in other part of the world, which have always been dictated by the old world rules that, you know, if you're in Bordeaux, you don't add a Burgundy to a Bordeaux. And if you're in the Burgundy region, you don't add anything from Spain to that. You know, and then this is all tried and tested, and obviously very strict in the appellations and the various control districts and parameters of, of European winemaking. And in America, and somewhat in Australia that I had a lot of experience with, and even South Africa, uh, they were following this kind of model, but there was absolutely no reason geographically why it had to be followed. Because I can go to a vineyard, vineyard say in Happy Canyon, and I can have some Viognier right next to some Albarino, which is Spanish or Portuguese, next to Loreiro, which is Portuguese, next to Gewürztraminer, which is German. So you weren't, you weren't, you didn't have to be geographically located. So I thought, well, let's explore that and let's make some blends based on where they are geographically now, right next to each other. So this was a little spin-off that I did and I opened here probably five or so years ago, September, it was actually September the 5th at one o'clock, which was serendipitous, it was 5.1. <laughs> uh, and so I just followed, you know what it was, I, I, I had this idea that Area 51 is a great example. And to avoid any copyright issues and have a little fun with it, I changed it to Area 5.1, which just happens to be my birthday as well. So, you know, it's a double-edged sword. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. All right, awesome. So let me get this straight. You landed in the funk zone with otherworldly wine. And I've always been of the belief that a tasting room should be a very fun place. It should be relaxing. It should be chill. It should be entertaining in the moment you walk in. Because there's nothing worse than people coming in who are intimidated by wine. Exactly. The wine knowledge part of it, just generally the whole wine attitude that sometimes had been projected upon the general population that you had to know something about wine to enjoy wine, which is wrong. It's like having a beer or a cola or a glass of whiskey. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and our show, The Wine Dude, right, is all about taking the snobbiness out of wine tasting. Yeah. And I constantly tell people to drink what you like and like what you drink. I always said, uh, like, we like to take the knob out of wine snob. But I think that was vaguely rude. So, you know. <laughs> not for this show. No, no, good, good, good. And so I was over there from 2007, and I looked across, you know, I was wandering around the area, and I could see it was starting to be gentrified. The Fun Zone was an established area that a lot of art studios and, and art warehousing took over from the original manufacturing area, and it got its name Funk Zone from these funky art sort of establishments. And then I saw it being gentrified and I saw people coming in and they're starting to develop the area and I'm like, you know, I can see what's going to happen here. Because, you know, that had been five years I'd already operating in, in the front zone, uh, five or six years. And it was ourselves and Oriana and Santa Barbara Winery and that was it really down in this area. And I could see and I saw the guy who was developing this particular area and I went up to him and I said, hey, I want in. I'd like to get a tasting room in here. And he asked me what the name of it was and I said, I don't even know yet. I'll come up with that later. So I just saw what was going to happen down here, um, you know, because I'd been a tenant and then just seen it emerging, you know, and it was a successful operation over there. So I thought, you know, as part of my little project to expand uh, kind of my winemaking sphere with my brother, that I would try and establish a new brand in a new location, in a great area that was going to become dynamic, and it has, and therefore that's how Area 5.1 came around. 
I think it's great, and that's why we're doing this special on the Funk Zone. Yeah. I want to bring people here to see all these really cool things. I mean, where are you going to find alien-based wine? Yeah. I mean, come on, you know? Yeah, they're not made by aliens. It's all local. But it's, uh... Oh, sorry, yeah. This is top secret. No <laughs> one's allowed to know this. That's but... right. See? Top secret. Yeah. See, I even opened my top secret file, and the first wine I see is... Collusion. Oh, who knew? Ooh. Who knew back in 2013, but that would become a popular word. Anyway, we'll leave that one alone, shall we? <laughs> Don't um, start any conspiracy No, here. so I, I, I decided to have a lot of fun naming the wines, and you know, you know, as we all know that the more wine you imbibe, the more hilarious you become, and imaginative you become, and that kind of rolled onto the naming of it as well. You know, so I had a lot of fun, and I continue to have a lot of fun, Naming the wines, describing them, and letting my staff have fun and use their imagination with what they want to say and what they want to do. So. Yeah, I think it's very cool here. Definitely. So what do you got for me? Well, you know, I always like to start the day with something that wakes up the palate. And in this situation, it's our Champagne Supernova. Now, I'm not allowed to call it Champagne because it's not from the Champagne region. But I just mentioned that because there's a song called Champagne Supernova, so if I say it all at once, I can get away with it. I see. So our sparkling wine, our Supernova, is Method Champenois, which I'm probably not going to say either, but it means it's a natural fermentation in the bottle. Uh, so a very traditional method. This is a Blanc de Blanc, which is from the Chardonnay grape. And uh, I used the facility to rack and riddle this to my desired style and I really wanted to have a very crisp, light, dry champagne or sparkling wine. I was I was always drawn to this because every time I went to a wedding or New Year's Eve or a big event, they would come out and they'd give you a champagne and you'd toast it, you'd take a sip and you'd put it down. Right. And I'd look around at the end of the day and there was all this sparkling wine, champagne going away. Yeah. And I'm like, that's because it's not approachable. It's either too sweet or too dry or it hasn't been chilled correctly. So I wanted to make one that was refreshing and approachable. Drinkable is the description I give it. And it is, it has that kind of very crisp dryness. You mm. don't, it's, it's really a palate cleanser. It really is. It's light, crisp, not too sweet. Yep. So I, I, I really like this, this is great. Yeah. So what, what kind of grapes are these? This is 100% Chardonnay. And this is from, uh, I got the grapes for this from the Sonoma County area. So, so is it, are they in oak? Uh, well, it's well, basically the way champagne works is once you take the wine and you put it back in the bottle, you re-ferment it. Right. Uh, it's going. That's where it's going to pick up all its characteristics. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, because it's light. Yeah. Mm. Very good. Yeah. I would definitely finish that at a wedding. Yeah. No. That 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 was the idea. I, all these people were just sitting around saying like, you know, oh, I've had my one sip of champagne, and then like, well, you, someone bought all this champagne for you, the sparkling wine, and no one drank it because it was either not a good selection or the wrong time of the evening. But you know, I believe that sparkling wine and champagne can be drunk at any time because they're the perfect food wine. So absolutely. they should be serving it with the dinner or something. Like that. Yeah, absolutely. And um, well, I'm not really known for leaving my wine. No, no, so. no, no. And then, then what I did is because I wanted to adapt to this new world style. Um, and I had a lot of experience. I lived in South Africa for four years and I'm from Australia. So I'd seen a lot of different styles and I lived in Europe for eight years. So I've seen and tasted a lot of wines from a lot of regions and been able to identify what I like. And not to say what I like, but what I think the customer and what the palate, particularly in California, the American palate in general, is moving towards. And it's moving away from their very traditional, big, oaky, buttery style Chardonnays, and very big, full-bodied Merlots and Cabs. And it's getting a little more sophisticated with the introduction or the, the, the you know, people relating to Pinot Noir, people relating to Syrah, and now because of such a great selection and a lot of good wine stores, people are really picking up on uh, new varietals that they've never heard before. And there's some really good merchants out there and really good wine stores that are showing different varieties. So I kind of tended my way to lean towards something a little bit different. And a good example of that is our White Light Chardonnay. It's 100% Chardonnay. And uh, this is from the San Inez Valley Fruit. And this is a wine which I did in conjunction with another winemaker, Chuck Carlson. And we did a very crisp, dry, stainless steel fermented Chardonnay. It's a little touch of oak aging on this, but not oak fermentation. Uh, and it keeps these really crisp, dry characteristics. And in particular, you don't have any of this oak overtones, buttery overtones. Mm -hmm. It keeps the, the Chardonnay grapes a beautiful grape to work with. 
And the original white burgundy style really did get extended by a lot of Californian winemakers to go oaky and super buttery. Because the Californian palate, American palate, in the 80s and 90s, liked a lot of big flavour. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was the palate we were dealing with. They liked soda, they liked candy. And so when wines came around, they're like, how do we adapt to this? Yeah. This one keeps the Chardonnay great, great characteristics of bright vitamin C fruit, yeah. particularly citrus. Yeah. Uh, Lemon, lime, grapefruit, grapefruit pineapple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's great summer wine. I always say to people when they're in here, picture yourself on a beach with a glass of wine on a hot day. You go for a crisp, cold wine to fill that glass while someone's cracking lobster tails, crab legs, shrimp, oysters. Yeah, that's the scene. It is interesting too because it's not overly buttery and it's not overly. Open. Well, there's, there's, you know, the malolactic fermentation hasn't really taken, you know, uh, any presence on it right. because once it's in stainless steel, it's not going to re-ferment itself. Right, right. Mm. Very good, very good, nice and crisp. Yeah. So then uh, let's just show a few wines. Not, you know, we don't want to take all of them up, but this is a fun one. I like. This is our Rosewell. Or Roswell. See what I did there? I see so, what you did there. I wanted to make a rosé and I was wondering what to call it. Like, I was just trying to think of something that was vaguely Area 51, US Air Force, America type thing. That was just so obvious. And this is a Grenache rosé. And uh, only about an hour and a half on the skins of the dark rosé, of the dark Grenache grape. Really gives it some characteristics which you like and it just picked up. Uh, a very little bit of strawberry on the finish, has a beautifully floral nose, so that nice delicate light pink colour. Very pretty. Yeah, and it's a really tasty, crisp, dry style of rosé. Southern European style, you know, sitting in a cafe in Avignon, watching people go by, having a nice glass of rosé. Mm. Let's do it in a Californian style as well. It's like uh, summer in a glass. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very dangerous wine, this one. This is, a, this is one that doesn't have a top secret warning, which could have a government warning that Bottles can be consumed quickly in a short amount of time without knowing what you did. <laughs> my, my cameraman Bert over here, he's gonna like this stuff. I can see him eyeing it off already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, he's just taken a bottle and gone out the back door. I don't know where he went. He's, Again, he does that yeah, every time. I don't know. Jeez. Mm. Mm. Ah, that's very good. Yeah, it's an easy drinking wine. Very easy. A lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that was good. I mean, it's just nice to, when I did my wine list, because I do a lot of blends, I will use wines that, you know, I have made or my brother Mike at Kalari Winery has made or other winemakers I know, and I'll blend sometimes some of theirs with ours because they will arrive saying, hey, I've got a case of something, case of, let's say, Tempranillo, or barrel, sorry, barrel of Tempranillo. I've got like, you know, 30 or so gallons as well, and I don't know what to do with it. It's not enough to do a single run of, you know, 30 cases. So, do you want to blend it to something you have got? And my approach has always been, it's like, what does my customer base want? What does the market in general, what's it looking for now? And I feel it's looking for a little bit of an adventure in wine. Yeah. So that's why blends have become popular. You know, it's very rare that someone comes in and says, I don't like blends, because that makes no sense. If you say, do you like Cab? Yes. Do you like Merlot? Yes. Do you like Cabernet Franc? Yes. What if we blended them together? Oh no, I don't like that. Like that doesn't make any sense yeah, to me. Exactly. And it's weird that very occasionally, it's very, very rare that someone comes and says, oh, I don't like blends. And that, that's just, and so I say, look, let's try this wine. And they're like, oh, I really like this wine. What is it? It's a blend. So it's that trial and error. And I wanted to find stuff that my customer base and the market in general liked. And that was all part of the ongoing education of new wine varietals that they hadn't had before. I mean, if I pour a white Rhone blend and I say it's Viognier, Marsan, and Roussan, they're like, I've never heard of those grape varietals. Exactly. And then you show them the bottle and they're like, oh, I've heard of Vognier. I'm like, well, you mean Viognier only pronouncing correctly. So I get what you're doing. So they're recognizing new names, but they don't understand them. So that's part of why we have wine tasting room, and that's to do that. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think people actually get the concept of blends. No, I, it, 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 yes, it always surprised me when they said they don't like them because, I mean, every blend is different, so they've never tried every blend, but it, they've just taken a, I don't know, sort of like an old school stand, like this is it. And, I Without, think, and, and you know, part of it is us educating them, yeah. and that's the beauty of having the wine tasting room, and why the Funk Zone works is, because we have a wine tasting room in a very accessible area for people just wandering around. If you're in a car and you're going to a winery, you're going there for a specific reason, and that is to go wine tasting and purchase some wine and put it in your car. When you're in an environment like the Funk Zone, you're getting people who are wandering by, it's like, you know, I don't know a lot about wine, 
I'd like to try wine, but I don't want to drive the whole way to the valley, we'll come in here. And that's what we really set ourselves up for. For people who knew us already, for wine club members, for wine aficionados and wine people who love their wine, without having to get in a car and go on a big journey. And so this area, the funk zone, is catching all of this foot traffic and all of this traffic from big city centers like San Diego and LA and, and, and Simi Valley that are coming up to Santa Barbara where two blocks from the ocean. In a beautiful town, the mountains behind us seem like a good place to have a wine tasting room. Which is why we're here. Yeah. Showing people. Yeah. It, 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 captures, it captures a lot of people that we might not have caught before. We have passed me that model, the long, the collusion on it, yeah. And by the way, um, I do, I like the strawberry finish on this. Yeah, I, I it see is. what you mean now. Yeah, it's not sweet, it's very refreshing. And it comes of, after a minute or yeah. so. Yeah, 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 that's great. So this is always a fun wine, we had the collusion. So what I do is when I take a blend and I name it, I generally have five or six blends. Uh, and every year, or every vintage when I create a new one, I keep the theme the same. For example, the white light is generally a Chardonnay based wine. The Close Encounter is a white Rhone style, maybe a variation on it. This collusion has always been a red Rhone. So it's been always a mixture of Syrah, Grenache, and Bourvedre. GSM. A GSM. Uh, but what I add along the way is I will add something else, I will change the percentages, so I keep the theme the same. Mm -hmm. So we've had this collusion since our first vintage in 2013. Uh, 2012 was the first vintage actually. Uh, this one is the same, Syrah Grenache Mourved. I've added about 8% Cabernet Sauvignon on this. Interesting. From a very nice vineyard up in the San Ynez Valley. And this one just shows off some really bright dark cherry and cranberry characteristics. And what I like about being able to change the vintage every year but keep the theme the same is I can slightly alter you know, the, the structure of the wine, the balance, the body, the, uh, you know, the integration of the different grapes as well. And it varies each year, which is because every vintage varies and every, you know, where I get my grapes from, I don't get them all from the same vineyards every year. And you know, I have to admit, I have been here a couple of times this is the wine I really like. I feel like though the times we've kicked you out a couple of times. That though we're not talking about that. What was that, Bert? That, that was that was Bert. Yeah, that had nothing to do with me. Um, uh, so we let kid, me we let kid. me ask you a quick question. Collusion, for those who don't know, tell me what the definition of collusion is. Collusion is a kind of loose definition of it, and that's really a legal term that comes with varying parties aligning with each other to create ideas notions, theories, and put them into operation. How's that for a legal definition? Okay, that works. So that works. a collusion between two people is like a conspiracy, it's like a coordinated effort to create something, whether it be legal or illegal. You know, I actually got this name because I pulled it out of a book on Area 51, and it was talking about a collusion between the military and the scientific bodies uh, in the 1950s when Eisenhower was deciding whether to build and construct a policy in the United States the administration to deal with the possibility of alien life and extraterrestrial infiltration into the United States and the world. It's kind of a great story. And the conclusion they came up with at the end is like, we will build a secret scientific base somewhere in the middle of nowhere and we'll deal with it. And that's kind of where Area 51 came from. And so... And know, the X-Files. And the X-Files. So now it's like conspiracy and collusion and theory and all this kind of scientific, science fiction words come out using far more prevalent than they used to be in the, in the last few years. We all know about that, but it's, you know, we don't go there. So the collusion is a little coordination and integration of a few different wines to create the final outcome. There you go. I like that. Yeah. And this wine's amazing. Yeah. And we actually also have a conspiracy red, which by coincidence um, has also become topical. So, you know. Is it really a coincidence? Uh, I don't know. No, it's who knows. <laughs> I, who knows what's out there? I want to believe, you know. I do want to believe. Yeah. I'm not a big Area 51, X-Files, alien, spaceship kind of guy. It's just made for a great theme for, uh, for winery. Yeah. You're kind of turning gray here. Tiny so, little gray you know, you and know. green and like other green. colors. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love it though. That's a really good wine. Yeah, and then the last one you can grab there is our Zinvasion. And this is a good example of a couple of different wines that wouldn't normally be friends in the old world. Zinfandel, a, a grape that has its origins in Croatia and in, in Italy, on the Adriatic coast is known as Primitivo. 
uh, and Malbec, which is originally a Bordeaux style, now planted a lot in South America and Argentina places. Uh, but these weren't far from each other in the vineyards, and I wanted a light, easy Zinfandel, so I didn't get I didn't get like a, a big hot weather area like say Paso Robles or Lodi, where they're very big, extracted old vine zins that are big and red and dark. This one's a little more subtle. And the Malbec adds to this a kind of little integration with a little bit of smokiness and dark berries, blueberries and blackberries going with some boysenberries and balancing it out. You know, it's a, I like this wine because it, it, it's got a certain complexity without being a big, full-on heavy wine. You know, mm -hmm. I've, you know, I've had a lot of big Zinfandels and you can see Zinfandel drinkers because they've got red lips and red teeth. <laughs> this, one, this one's a, lot, a little bit lighter in so the body. So these Zin grapes come from where? Up here? No, these Zin grapes actually come from a friend's vineyard up in the Sierra foothills, El Dorado County. Oh, interesting. You know, and that's, uh, you know, I, I put that on the appellation this time, El Dorado Hills, just because I like to show off his vineyard. So uh, a little bit cooler. Mm. Yeah. And I get that little bit of dryness from the Malbec. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so yeah. the tannins on this are there, but they're not heavily obvious. Good food wine. A local, mm -hmm. a local chef here had paired this with a dark flourless chocolate tort, which I thought was a really oh, good food pairing. Interesting. Because I do a lot, I like to do a lot of food pairing. I've I was going to say try to. I've got some very good customers who are chefs, and and, and you know we, we talk a lot about it, and we do a lot. I do a lot of wine dinners, mm. so that's kind of a lot of fun. All right, cool. Well, this is really good. Yeah. And then you know I have always you know another couple of blends that uh, sitting in barrel waiting to be released. I've got uh, our majestic twelve blend, which is always an Italian one, Sangiovese, Nebbiolo, Barbera, and oh. or something else. And I vary that route. You know, I've had some. When's that coming? I've out? had some Chabonet. That should be out within the next month or two. Okay. And then a new conspiracy red. And the, the most interesting one I did was one called Celestial, which was a Santa Rita Hills Pinot Noir from Buena Terra Vineyards. And I blended that with some Petit Syrah. So oh. that would have turned some heads. Interesting. And some old French winemakers turn them in their grave, knowing that I put a, a Santa Rita Hills Pinot with uh, a San Inez Valley Petit Syrah. But it was a fantastic wine, and we sold out of it. Like we couldn't keep it in stock. Wow! You know, people liked Pinot, but it was a little more full-bodied and rounder, but without big tannic flavors. It was it was super popular, and that was called Celestial. And then I have Equinox, and I've got a Declassified Port. So there's a few. I have fun. So okay. when, it, when it needs for me to create a new name, sometimes I'll create the name and then follow it with a wine. Who knows? You know, that's the beauty right. of blending. It's all about yeah. concept. Yeah, it's like your yeah. winery. Yeah, it's a it's a concept. Yeah. yeah. So this place is really cool, and you're only going to find this stuff in the Funk Zone here at Area 5.1 Winery. And Martin's usually here, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm here on the weekends, and Monday is my day in here to unwind everyone from the weekend. But I've got super staff; they're a lot of fun and relaxed, and we, we have it. We have a good time, and that's what you've got to have with wine, don't you? Absolutely. So if you guys are looking for good wine, good blends, and a conspiracy. Come here to yeah. Area 5.1. Yeah, expect the unexpected. That's right. To boldly go where no winery has gone before. <laughs> In a vineyard far, far away. Yeah, yeah so we get carried away. <laughs> Excellent. Thank Thanks, you. Bert. Yeah. Bert, come back. He's gone. He's gone. Wine dude, signing off. Hopefully, I won't get abducted. Or probed. Or pro. Oh. <laughs> Oh man. <laughs> <laughs>